James Fraser, the giant, the superhero. Note the superhero background wallpaper. Author of The Golden Bough, all 12 volumes of it. The book The Golden Bough had an index that was 400 pages long. That's how much research Fraser did to publish his book. Knowledgeable, masterful, influential, legendary Sir James Fraser. The Golden Bough has never gone out of print. If you go to Amazon today and look up The Golden Bough, you find almost 900 results. That's how influential this book is. And you find version after version, cover after cover, the one volume version, the new one volume version, the 12 volume version, the two volume version every year. There's a new version of The Golden Bough coming out. And if you look at Amazon reviews, they are laudatory. They praise this book as being life-changing, masterful, commanding. One reviewer, as you can see at the top of the page there, calls The Golden Bough jaw-dropping. Another reviewer says that it gives you the basis of religion. You can understand all religion if you read The Golden Bough. Amazing, daunting, and necessary, says the reviewer in the lower left-hand corner. On the right, you can see five stars for the thinking person. Holy cow, this book changed my life. Well, guess what? Sir James Fraser is now regarded as an antique. History has passed him by. Serious scholars no longer believe what Sir James Fraser wrote. Serious scholars have several problems with his book, The Golden Bough. Let's talk about those problems. Scholarly fashion is just like fashion in clothing or hairstyles. What was really popular decades ago is not popular today. Yes, at one time, Sir James Fraser was the hottest thing in scholarship. Since his death, though, real scholars regard Fraser as hopelessly outdated. Regular people often don't know this, so many regular people still cling to Fraser as the hottest thing going. They think he's the last word in the study of religion and belief. This is unfortunate because there are big problems with Fraser's The Golden Bough. These problems are his methodology, his theory, and his attitude. As we've mentioned, Sir James Fraser was an armchair scholar. He rarely traveled. He was from the United Kingdom, from Scotland, and he stayed there. He made a trip to Italy once. He felt he had the authority to write about people living all over the world, people he had never met. Fraser took his material from accounts written by merchants, missionaries, and military men. When you read The Golden Bough, did you ever ask yourself, do these people really believe all these things? Did they really practice all these rituals? Did the merchants, missionaries, and military men who wrote all this down really get all the details? Did Sir James Fraser really pick up all the details? Did he add anything? Did he subtract anything? Did he massage the facts in order to support his own conclusion? We can't really know about the people 
that the merchants, missionaries, and military men were writing about because they were writing their accounts over 100 years ago. And modernization has stepped in. The Indian subcontinent is a very different place today than it was 100 years ago during the Victorian era, well, over 100 years ago during the Victorian era. So we, we, can't, we can't really know whether the accounts are accurate, and we can't really know whether Fraser smudged the edges of the facts because he had a conclusion that he wanted to support. And so he took some facts about remote people's lives and changed those facts so that they could fit into his paradigm. And paradigm means pattern. Sir James Fraser had a pattern that he wanted to support in his writing and he could cherry pick and cherry pick is a word you should understand. Cherry pick means picking and choosing from an infinite number of facts in order to support a foreordained conclusion. Did Fraser do that? So our first problem with Sir James Fraser is his methodology, that he was an armchair scholar, that he did not travel to study the people that he wrote about. Our second problem with Fraser is his attitude. Fraser had open contempt for the people about whom he wrote. He thought that they were less than he. He believed that the people he was writing about were savages and barbarians, and he believed himself to be a civilized man. Fraser was once asked if he had ever met a savage. Thanks heavens, no, he said. He never met the people he was writing about. And he didn't want to meet the people he was writing about. Compare Fraser's contempt to the respect that anthropologists have for their subjects today. Henry Glassie was my teacher. He spent years working on the book, Passing the Time in Ballymenon, about a small village in Ireland. He told me privately that one of his informants was gay, was a homosexual, and that being gay in a small village in Ireland was a hard thing to be. But Glassy did not put that information in his book because he respected his informants. For me, I thought he should put that information in the book in order to have complete scholarship that tells the whole truth about this village in Ireland and about the dark side of the village, the village's intolerance and homophobia and how hard it was to be gay in an Irish village. But Henry Glassie put his informants first before scholarship. He wanted to protect the person who had given him this information. And so his book, in my opinion, is incomplete, but his book is an expression of his love and his respect for his informants. And you don't find that in Fraser. Fraser doesn't care about his informants' feelings. All he cares about is the book. Another problem with Fraser, and this problem we're going to break down into two parts. And this problem is Fraser's theory. And there are two problems with Fraser's theories. One theory is the theory that informs Fraser's work. And that theory is called unilinear evolution. This theory is influenced by Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin said that human beings evolved from lesser species. This is the theory of evolution. 
that the first life form was perhaps a one-celled creature, those cells divided slowly but surely over the course of billions of years, fish developed, and again, slowly but surely over the course of millions of years, reptiles evolved, and slowly but surely over the course of millions of years, mammals evolved, and there were ape-like creatures, and slowly but surely, human beings evolved. This theory influenced James Fraser, and Fraser believed that primitive peoples, that is, people who are hunter-gatherers, who often don't have clothing, who don't have permanent dwellings, who don't own many possessions, and these people we can label with the name primitive, and we don't mean it in a derogatory way. We mean it just to indicate everything that I just said. They're hunter-gatherers. They often don't wear clothing. They often don't have many possessions. They often don't have permanent homes. That these people are comparable to primitive life forms. We can compare them to fish or reptiles or amphibians. And just as humans evolved from creatures that eventually became mammals, in this theory, the mid-stage is occupied by peasants, and that's the photograph you see on the left. And the peasants are people who live in permanent dwellings, practice agriculture, probably don't have many books in their home, maybe they don't wear shoes, uh, they might not have much medical care. And then what Fraser would call civilized people is represented by the picture in the upper left-hand corner. And these are people who own many possessions and who have fancier homes and have lots of books. And similarly, in terms of the mental life of people, the people who are the hunter-gatherers would be called animists. That is, they believe that a spirit lives inside of plants and trees and animals. That word is animist, A-N-I-M-I-S-T. And then the peasants would be considered religious, and they are part of a larger religious community. They're Catholic, they're Jewish, they're Muslim, they're Hindu, they're Buddhist, one of the big world religions, not just a local religion like our tree, our pond has a special tree spirit or a pond spirit. That's animism. When you're part of one of the big world religions, the big five are considered to be Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. And then the people who have reached the stage of civilization have rejected religion. They recognize that religion is silly and they believe in science. So this is unilinear evolution and it's a theory that Fraser believed. And the people he's writing about in The Golden Bough are the primitive people and the peasants. And these are the people who believe in a supernatural world. And once you reach the pinnacle of evolution, you no longer believe in God, you no longer believe in religion, you no longer believe in the tree spirit, you no longer believe in magic because you are civilized and civilized people just don't believe in these beliefs. And here's another depiction of the same theory. Think of it as a pyramid or as a ladder with a bottom and a top. And civilized man is at the top of the ladder and the peasants are in the middle of the ladder and the uh, hunter-gatherer people are at the bottom of the ladder. And the words that the people who believe in unilinear evolution used, the people at the bottom, they called them savages. The people in the middle, they called them barbarians. And the people at the top, they called them civilized. And these, this is a theory that Fraser believed. And here's another way of looking at unilinear evolution. You've got the primitive people, the people who are hunter-gatherers, who don't own a lot of possessions, who, who uh, don't have permanent dwellings. Uh, people like Fraser would absolutely compare them to monkeys or even to fish. They're lower down in the evolutionary scale. The peasants might be compared to mammals like uh, squirrels or something, and the civilized man would be compared to um, homo sapiens.
And here are a couple of slides that I found online that are also attempting to explain the same theory, the theory of unilinear evolution. We, and you see the pyramid on the left there, uh, lower savagery, middle savagery, upper savagery, barbarism, 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 civilization. And the slide on the right, everything of those choices is true. It's influenced by Darwin. It says that different people represent different grades of development and it defines stages of savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And no one accepts this theory today. This is a theory that Fraser believed in, but no one today accepts this theory, nor should they, because it is, uh, it is a, a, a very classist theory. I don't want to call it racist. Some people call it racist, but uh, white people can be just as low as dark-skinned people. And it's based on how, ma how many things you have. Like if you have a lot of things and you don't believe in God, you're a civilized person. And if you don't own a lot of things and you believe in God, you are a savage. So this theory is rejected today. Now, there's another problem with Fraser's theory. Fraser advanced a theory called the dying and rising God theory. This theory is frequently used to discredit Christianity. Many people are hostile to religious belief. They see religious belief as irrational and destructive, and they want to eliminate religious belief. Since Christianity is a large and influential religion, if you can discredit Christianity, all the other religions will be discredited. If you can prove Christianity wrong, that's also going to be damaging to Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and all the rest. So why did Fraser advance this theory of dying and rising gods? Well, Fraser was critical, very critical of Christianity. And Remember previously, I said that Fraser massaged the facts. He smudged the facts. He cherry picked facts. Why did he do that? He did that in order to support this theory of dying and rising gods. And basically what Fraser wanted to say was that there was never an historical human being called Jesus and that Jesus was just another mythological figure and that people all over the world believed in dying and rising gods just like Jesus. And that's something that Fraser says again and again in The Golden Bough. And there are many atheists today who want to use Fraser to discredit Christianity and by extension to discredit all religions. And this is what they say. They say that all these mythological gods die and rise just like Jesus. And in the upper right hand corner there, you see a Greek who's wearing a leopard skin around his shoulders. And I hope you remember that the guy with the leopard skin around his shoulders is Dionysus or Dionysus. And you'll see upper in the upper left hand corner, you'll see a Greek god named Osiris who was chopped up into 14 pieces and destroyed and his sister had to collect the pieces and try to bring him back to life. And these are all from websites and you, you can find these websites all over the web saying Sir James Fraser proves that Jesus never existed and that Jesus was just another dying and rising God. But you know, it's just not true. Um, Here's a slide that I found on the web, someone trying to summarize um, how Fraser was used by people trying to prove that Jesus never existed. And here again is another slide from the web going through how Fraser is used in the Jesus never existed camp. And this is just a cut and paste of the Wikipedia page, which you should not feel obligated to read. Obviously the print is very tiny, but there's a whole Wikipedia page discussing this dying and rising God theory. A guy by the name of Trigvit N.D. Mettinger wrote a book debunking, debunking means proving false, debunking Fraser's theory 
about the dying and rising gods. And he goes through mythology from the ancient Middle East and he says, no, you know, Jesus is not based on these other mythological figures and here's the proof. And as you can see, this book has only two customer reviews. So it's not the world's most popular book. And as you can see from the upper right hand corner, it's out of print. And remember, the Golden Bow has never gone out of print. It's bought every day. Somebody buys a copy of the Golden Bow. But this book that goes through Fraser's claims in a very scholarly fashion is virtually unread. Here's a couple of books that actually are pretty popular. If you're interested in this topic, have a look at them. Don't feel obligated. I've read both of them. I find them both fascinating because I'm really interested in how people either prove true or don't prove true ancient mythology. Uh, this one is called The Jesus Legend, and the next one is called The Case for the Real Jesus. And just if you're interested in this topic, check out these books. If not, no harm. And also, if you're interested in this topic, check out the Wikipedia page called The Historicity of Jesus. Historicity means whether or not someone actually lived or whether or not something actually happened. I'm sure you've heard of the Trojan War. You can read a Wikipedia page on the historicity of the Trojan War, like whether or not the Trojan War really happened, uh, whether or not Abraham, who is said to be the first historical Jew, whether or not he ever existed. Moses, the guy who supposedly led the Jews out of the Promised Land, there's a big debate as to whether or not Moses ever existed. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, there is a big debate about whether or not Muhammad ever existed and Jesus. And again, there is debate whether or not Jesus ever existed. So if you're interested in these topics, all you have to do is Google historicity Trojan War, historicity Muhammad, historicity Jesus, and you can see historians providing what they think is the evidence one way or the other. And how this relates to our topic is that most historians think that Fraser was wrong and that there was an historical person named Jesus. I'm not saying that historians believe that Jesus is God. That's a different question. But there is a question as to whether or not he actually existed, whether or not there was like a flesh and blood man who walked around and talked to people and was crucified. And most historians say yes that this guy Jesus probably existed. So Fraser's theory about that Jesus never existed, that he was just another dying and rising God has been rejected. Now here's another reason that Fraser is no longer the big name in anthropology. I want you to notice the guy on the left wearing the white hat. And this guy just totally knocks Fraser right out of the water. And here he is again. He's sitting in the middle with his pals. And who is this guy? This guy is Bronisław Malinowski. And as the name suggests, he is a Pole. And he's the inventor of the concept of participant observation, which completely overthrows Fraser's method of being an armchair scholar. Here's Malinowski hanging out with his homies in the Trobriand Islands. And the Trobriand Islands are in the Pacific, the South Pacific Ocean, close to Australia, New, New Guinea, and New Zealand. So they're about as far away from Europe as you can get. And here's a map showing you Melanesia. The Trobriand Islands are part of Melanesia. And if you have a look at Australia, which is in the lower left-hand corner of the map, and you look up, you see PNG, that's Papua New Guinea, and the Trobriand Islands are near Papua New Guinea. So they're very, very, very far away from Europe. And Bronisław Malinowski himself was from Poland, and you can see Poland there in the center of Europe. And if you move your finger, to the left, one country, that's Germany. Move it a little bit over to the left, that's the low countries. Move it a little bit over to the left, that's the English Channel. And then finally to that country that's floating in what looks like the North Sea, that's England. And England and Australia controlled the Trobriand Islands when 
Malinovsky traveled there. Malinovsky traveled there during World War One or during the same era as World War One. And this map shows you how Europe was divided during World War One. So uh, Malinovsky is from Poland, which is controlled by Germany and Russia. And Germany is on the opposite side as England. You can see Germany is colored in green and England is colored in red. So these two countries are at war with each other. And Austria-Hungary also controls part of Poland, and that's also green, so it's also at war with England. So Malinowski, even though he was not, you know, he was not fighting in the war, he was from a country that was at war with England. And so once he got to the Trobriand Islands, he could not leave. He was basically arrested by the Australians and he had to stay there for a long time. So you've got Fraser sitting in his comfortable chair, reading these accounts written by merchants, missionaries, and military people. And Malinowski is actually living in the Trobriand Islands with the Trobriand Islanders. And he was invited to give a speech in honor of Sir James Fraser in 1925. And his speech totally knocked Fraser out of the water. I shall invite my readers to step outside the closed study of the theorist into the open air of the anthropological field and to follow me in my mental flight back to the years I spent among a Melanesian tribe of New Guinea, there paddling on the lagoon, watching the natives under the blazing sun at garden work, following them through the patches of jungle and on the winding beaches and reefs, we shall learn about their life. And again, observing their ceremonies in the cool of the afternoon or in the shadows of the evening, sharing their meals round their fires, we shall be able to listen to their stories. So Fraser is sitting in his comfy chair, reading accounts written by others. Malinowski is living with the Trobriand Islanders. He's seeing them live their lives, doing their gardening, telling their stories. Malinowski can understand people in a way that Fraser never could. And here are a few slides giving Malinowski's birth and death years, 1884-1942. Just remember early 20th century. That's all you have to remember, that he's active in the early 20th century and that he invented the participant observation method of doing anthropology. You're not sitting in a chair reading somebody else's account. You're going to another country. You're learning a language. You're studying a people. Now, the next theorist is this man. And what you should get from each one of these photographs is that this person takes himself very seriously. He thinks of himself as important and authoritative. He has the right to define how you think and he has the right to define religion and to tell you why you believe in God. And you don't have that right because you don't really understand your own mind. And this is, of course, Sigmund Freud. And his years are 1856 to 1939. But again, you don't have to remember those years. Remember early 20th century. It is impossible to overestimate how influential Sigmund Freud is. Sigmund Freud is one of the most influential thinkers who has ever lived. And this is an article from the New York Times. And as you can see, the headline says, Freud shaped the 20th century mind. How you think, how you think about yourself, how you think about other people, all influenced by Sigmund Freud. And here are some basic facts. Again, 1856 to 1939, you don't have to remember those years, just remember early 20th century. You do need to remember that he is associated with the city of Vienna, which is a city in Austria. So you have to remember those two things, that he is associated with Vienna, 
Austria. He wanted to be famous and he wanted to be important and he certainly became both. He was initially a medical doctor, so his training was to treat people's physical problems. Broken leg, broken arm, cold, what have you. But he did not think that that's where his destiny lay. He believed that he was going to explain the human mind and how the human mind works, including religious belief. He developed something called psychoanalysis, and you need to know the word psychoanalysis, and you need to know exactly what psychoanalysis entails. Psychoanalysis means something very specific. This is Freud's office, and you need to know what this looks like, and you need to be able to identify this. First, I want you to notice the dominant color. The dominant color in this office is red. It's like a second womb. It's as if Freud is bringing his patients back into the womb to relive being born. I want you also to notice in the upper left of the photograph where Freud sat. And I want you to notice where the patients put their heads. The patients put their heads in such a position that they could not see the therapist. The therapist could see them, but the patient could not see the therapist. So psychoanalysis, as Freud invented it, did not involve a face-to-face -face conversation. It involved the patient lying on a couch and not making eye contact with the therapist. The patient lies on the couch for approximately 50 minutes, five zero minutes, and free associates. That is, talks about whatever comes to mind, including describing dreams. And the therapist listens to this and take notes, but doesn't really say much of anything. And through this process, the patient eventually makes material that is in the subconscious conscious. So perhaps the patient has a compulsion to wash his hands. He has to wash his hands 20 times a day. And he talks to the therapist year after year because this process can take years for 15 minutes at a stretch. And eventually the patient comes to realize that the reason he needs to wash his hands 50 times a day is because he always wanted to kill his father and have sex with his mother. But he didn't realize that before until he had these long free association sessions with a therapist. I also want you to notice the busts in the upper left corner of the photograph. These are busts of religious and mythological figures. Freud wanted to take the place of religion. Freud believed that religion was not good for people, that it's irrational, that it's from a lower level of development, and religion should be overcome, and people should become atheists, and they should think in scientific terms, that is, in the terms that he provided. Some of Freud's theories, and this is by no means an, an exhaustive list, but some of Freud's theories include penis envy, castration anxiety, Oedipus complex, and electric complex. All women suffer from penis envy. All women notice that they have a hole or an indentation where men have something that juts out. And so women want that. All women want penises. Uh, Freud also argued that all men suffer from castration anxiety. They're afraid that some woman is going to come along and chop off their penis. And where did men get this idea? As soon as a man, uh, as a boy, saw a woman naked for the first time, and he saw that a woman had an indentation where he has something that juts out, he assumed that someone chopped off that woman's penis, and so the man is afraid that someone's going to chop off his penis. 
the Oedipus complex is the desire of boys to kill their fathers and have sex with their mothers. And the Electra complex is the desire of girls to kill their mothers and have sex with their fathers. And this is a chart I found online that shows the uh, subconscious that we are only aware of a few of our thoughts. Like uh, I look at a clock and I see that the clock says it's 3 p.m. and I'm aware of that. I'm aware that I'm looking at a clock. I'm aware that I'm concluding that it's 3 p.m. But I'm not aware that I have always wanted to kill my mother and have sex with my father. So when it comes to folk tales, traditional material, myths, songs, games, art, riddles, etc., anything longer than it is wide is a phallic symbol. So in folk tales or spells or anything having to do with traditional material, if a flute is mentioned, a feather, a magic wand, a pen, a tower, uh, a plant that is longer than it is wide, like a banana, that is a phallic symbol. Anything that involves a hole or that's cup-shaped, for example, the Holy Grail. You know, you have, you have all these legends from the Middle Ages about knights going in search of the Holy Grail, which is meant to be the chalice that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. That's actually a vagina or at least a vaginal symbol. Uh, anything that's round is a breast, or even anything that comes in pairs is a breast. Um, Alan Dundies will argue that earrings, because there's two of them, are symbolic of breasts. Uh, anything that's brown and mushy is symbolic of feces. Anything that's yellow and liquid is symbolic of urine. Anything that's liquid and salty is symbolic of semen. Freud was influenced by Darwin and by James Frazier's The Golden Bough. Freud believed in unilinear evolution. He believed that human beings would pass through three stages, animism, religion, and scientific atheism. Freud was hostile to religion. Freud was Jewish, and as the Nazis were advancing towards Vienna, Freud said, my real enemy is the Roman Catholic Church. So in other words, he was saying, I don't have to worry about the Nazis. I'm really scared of the Catholics. But eventually he did um, leave Vienna. Uh, Freud believed that children, the mentally ill, and primitive people were all comparable. They're all on the same level of development and all in need of being rescued from their mistaken beliefs. And psychoanalysis can rescue you. Now, Freud wrote a book called Totem and Taboo. And in the book, Totem and Taboo, Freud said that our ancestors, all humans, share the same ancestors. And these ancestors are called the primal horde. And the primal horde is a group of humans living together in a small group. And this primal horde is dominated by a dominant alpha male. And the dominant alpha male gained this position by suppressing all the other males in the primal horde by beating on them and, you know, just claiming exclusively for himself. And once the uh, alpha male beats up all the other beta males, the alpha male alone is able to have sexual access to the females of the primal horde. And Freud might support this by pointing to uh, people living close to the land where it's not uncommon to find a tribal chieftain who has many wives. So you can look at uh, images of tribal chieftain with many wives and think about the primal horde. So Freud argued that our ancestors living in this primal horde became really, really angry because they wanted to have sex with the women and they were tired of this alpha male beating up on them. And so they killed the alpha male and they ate him. And the, the eating him was this big cannibal meal, like everybody in the primal horde, men, women, children, all got together and ate 
the alpha male who had previously claimed exclusive access to the females. And that, according to Sigmund Freud, is the basis of all religion. Every religion on earth somehow descends from this primal horde where the tribe members joined together and killed the alpha male who laid exclusive claim to the female and cooked him and ate him. 